Hi, I'm Seth Pringle. Welcome to the Claremont Lewis Museum of Art for our new exhibition, Transformations in Glass, Vitreous, Funk, Fantasy, and Light. The exhibition is on view through February 5th, 2023, featuring the work of Richard Marquis, KK Cribs, and David Svensson, who uh, spent formative years in Claremont and also developed their work at the Pilchuck Glass School, where the uh, merging of arts and crafts that we're so familiar with in Claremont was able to be fostered by the vision of, of Dale Chihuly, the founder of the Pilchuck Glass School. We're very excited to be bringing these three artists back to Claremont to be uh, exhibiting uh, in this very exciting glass, neon, mixed media exhibition. Hi, I'm KK Cribs, and... And I'm David Svensson, and we're so happy to be here and honored to be at the Claremont Lewis Museum to, to share, uh, share our work with you. We came up with this concept of taking three artists that had been here living in the 60s uh, and really influenced by the freedom of <laughs> artistic pursuits of the times, yeah, Richard Marcus uh, graduated from Upland High in 1963. In uh, his formative years of middle school and, and high school, he was uh, kind of surrounded by the Claremont community, the LA County Fair as well, uh, where the art shows would show art and craft together, and, and I'm sure he was influenced by that. And somehow, we all ended up at Pilchuck Glass School. Somehow we all got into glass and then were drawn to Pilchuck because Although the glass movement itself really started kind of in the 70s as a very experimental technique where all the information was really European. I mean, it was in Germany and Poland and Czechoslovakia and Italy, of course, and all the way back to the Egyptians. There wasn't much information here in this country. And so Dale Chihuly was really an initiator for creating a place, Pilchuck Glass School, which is up in the state of Washington, was really created to encourage artists to be very experimental with this new material. And so when I met Dick in 1983, he was there teaching, and I came as a student uh, to work with Klaus Moye. And so Klaus Moye actually it was the first time that he uh, was at Pilchuck with glass that was made to be compatible that Bullseye had created. So the whole point, the whole difficulty with glass, right, is compatibility of colors. So if you, it used to be that if you had a red and a blue, you couldn't put them together because they would explode. So really the whole glass movement became anchored and dependent on color compatibility. So Dick started also working with Bullseye and their efforts to make a huge range of, of compatible glass color. He was given a Fulbright, he went to Italy, he learned the uh, techniques of Murini. And yeah, Murano Mur had all of those techniques for hundreds of years, and there's a curiosity to go to Murano to, to study those. And, and glass being a very secretive uh, medium, uh, the families that handed down, uh, they're similar with the neon, the families are handed down from father to child uh, to continue on there, but to, to get into that community to, uh, to learn those techniques uh, had takes a unique person who, who uh, is so curious about who it. Who would bring it back and share it. <laughs> would bring it back and share it. And, and you know, the whole Chihuly movement with Will Pilchuk, bringing these artists from all over the world, including Murano, to Pilchuk to share those uh, techniques and uh, so forth was what Pilchuk is all about. That's what lured me there. And I briefly got to meet uh, uh, Richard Marquis when he was teaching at one of the master's classes. And uh, I, I lo I've loved his work since I saw it first in uh, American Craft Magazine before I ever got into glass. And, and uh, just to meet him was such an honor. And it's an incredible honor to have his work represented here at the Claremont Lewis Museum. And so the title that we came up with, Transformations in Glass, really is the core of that. It's like each of us has taken glass as a medium and done something really different with it. Mm -hmm. And then the funk, well, he's definitely, <laughs> Dick is definitely the funk, you know, because he would paint on the glass, he would put wheels on it, he brought a sense of humor to it. Before that, it was very staid. It was all about things being perfect and no glue, no scratches, no bubbles, all these rules. And 
You know, it was, he was definitely at the forefront with Thurman Statham of going in and just breaking all those rules. Mm. So that was encouraging because when I got to Pilchuck, I was like, I was unaware that there was a glass movement. First of all, I was showing in a glass gallery, Curlin Summers in Los Angeles, but I didn't know that there was a family of explorers out there. So it was a huge introduction That's to me. That's where I saw your work first at Curlin Summers Gallery. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the memory uh -huh. coming back. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, we, we, go, were... we go pretty far back. <laughs> Don't we? we? We're elders now. <laughs> That's right, we're elders. <laughs> so the Murini technique is one of the things that Dick especially uses, which um, it's all about uh, bundling color, pulling it out, making these rods. It's kind of like doing cookies or something. Candy making. Candy, candy making. making. It's very much aligned with candy making. And it's, it's eye candy, what he ends, his results are incredible. And it's eye candy. <laughs> and, and he was studying Murano at the same time Dale Chihuly went there. So he's he kind of hand in hand with uh, the pioneers of the American glass movement. And so I would say that all three of us have a lot of humor and a lot of color and a lot of desire to continue experimenting. So this exhibition really um, is interesting that you would have three apparently disparate artists, but we're all completely linked. We are, <laughs> yeah, in, in more ways than just glass. Huh. It's that funk side, Not by height. <laughs> yeah, not by height. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. yeah. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. We're going to continue showing you the other um, galleries. And um, we're so glad to be able to share with the world uh, this exhibition because it's a beautiful space. It's in Claremont, California. It's in the old train depot. The architecture is gorgeous. And, but it's intimate. And at the same time, you'll see as you go into the other galleries, it's um, perfect. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This has turned out to be the best experience because all the lenders that were willing to send their work to this, so the works date from 1985 to the present, so it's actually, it's like a mini retrospective. Um, and for me to be able to see these works that I've made through the 90s, etc., it's just really been a joy. I mean, and and I think what's actually really cool is to actually see that the continuity is like I've never, I've always been me. <laughs> I still make the thing, you know, I'm just like very dedicated to my, I don't want to say to my craft exactly, but to, um, I want things to be beautiful. I want them to shine. I want them to have an inner glow. And I want, if somebody has it in their home, for it to make them equally happy. So I, this is one of my favorite pieces himself. And uh, it was done... We lived in Ireland for a long time, and so you always talk, ah, oh, sure, himself, he'll be there. He's got a nice barn for sale. <laughs> so I don't know, I always like the way that was a term of speaking about someone else. And so in this, he's got the map behind him and then all the mosaics. So I don't know, probably a lot of people looking at this work aren't really familiar with seeing glass done this way, but the way I work, I started out as a sandblaster and engraver, putting imagery onto glass that was clear. And eventually I evolved to a place where I was setting the glass in front of a background um, where the light and color could come through it because I just desired color. And then I started reverse painting, first with oil paints, and then learned about the ancient techniques, sort of European techniques of enamels on glass. So all the stained glass windows that you see, it's enamels that are applied to the glass and then fired in a kiln. And so those are usually built for transparency, so you have light coming through the image. But my goal with the way I work is I take window glass, very simple, poor man's material, and I start layering many layers of enamel on and firing them. And then I cut it all up and reassemble it. I've also developed other techniques along the way of um, like this piece over here, where it's actually applied onto blown glass. And then I actually had to slump the painting to fit the glass. And that was like a really mechanical, tricky thing to figure out. <laughs> so somehow or another, I'm equally scientist and artist at the same time because a lot of the problem solving is actually a big part of the joy for me.
And you can see that I worked in ceramics and glass and wood and glass. And now I'm doing what I call thin shell concrete, which is where I actually build up. Uh, I use a hump mold, which I would have developed when I was working in ceramics, build up drywall tape, fiberglass drywall tape and, and thin set mortar to build my forms. So some of these standing figures are done that way. The boats are done that way. The beauty of these really becomes the sparkle because once you cut up all those little tiny, tiny pieces of glass, they're like sequins or diamonds or, you know, and if you have it in a, a place where the sun comes in, the whole room lights up with stars. <laughs> Even here on the base, you know, you can see the shadow is like all glittery. So the whole thing with glass, when you reverse paint on it, is that it's a refractory material. The light comes in to the glass and it bounces back out again. So when you have color behind it like that, or mirror, or gold leaf, <clears throat> the image that's brought back out to the viewer is enhanced. It's like it's magnified. And the colors remain almost like, I always think of wet river stones. So it's like they remain brilliant, like paint coming right out of a tube. Whereas if it were on a surface, you know, a canvas surface, for example, it gets a dull tone to it. So my real fascination is really in pushing the materials to the max, really, and to, to get the most color and the most texture that I can out of what I'm using. Mm -hmm. So I did this piece uh, in 2021, and I think I spent three months doing the mosaics on it. It was really, it's probably the tiniest mosaics that I've ever done up to now, because I don't usually have the luxury of that kind of time. So going back to what I was talking about when we were talking about Dick Marquis and humor, I think there's always a lot of humor in my work behind the, the glorious color and all the sparkle and everything else. I mean, I love the, the beauty of the material, but I also really am wanting to talk about, I don't like to use the word human condition, but just the commonality of what we all have in common in our lives. Um, you know, happiness, sadness, challenges. And certainly the boat pieces are all about that. It's like the voyage through life and really um, living it to the max, but also taking on the challenges without losing direction of where you're going. Um, keeping your goals in place, not getting beaten down. Probably even like in the kimono figures, it's very much about that. It's like you may look like a ragman, but you're a king. You take what you've landed with, what you've been given in life, and you take it forward and make the best of it. That's kind of what I want people to get out of it when they look at the work. You can see that in all of these figures, um, this is a good example of doing the sandblasting and then floating the image in front of a, a painted cavity, basically, so that when the light comes in, it hits the image, but it also lights up the area behind it. It brings color into the glass, and yet there is a depth to it, so it gives them a home. So I always call these the man within the man. So the whole concept really is that as people, we often, um, we don't want to expose our full selves to people. We do a lot to disguise ourselves. We wear clothing to send a, send a, a specific message that we want other people to read. So many times all of our little insecurities or the things that we hide are hidden underneath. So this is an exposure by opening the coat of seeing the man inside the man. So these are painted linen. Some of them I did, you know, as actual gesso on linen, so it's, that's stiffer. And that one is really very early on from when I was living in New Bedford. I started a glass program in New Bedford after uh, the program in artisanry at Boston University closed out their program and turned this, the area over into nursing. And so. So many people came out of the program of artisanry. It was Alphonse Mattia, Fred Wool, um, Chris Gustin. Uh, and so they all ended up down in New Bedford at the Swain School of Design, which was this tiny little school, but they had a big, beautiful building. It was an old mill building, three stories high. And so when I went there to start the program, I hadn't really gotten, I had never had access to tools because <laughs> I'm completely self-taught. We'll just insert that here. I am self-taught. 
So when I ended up at Swain, I got to have access to the wood department, the metal department in particular, because those were on my floor. And the students taught me a lot. So this piece was done while I was in New Bedford. So the next thing that I developed along the way with bullseye glass, these pieces were made at bullseye during an artist residency. Um, and Dave Janak was gaffing the glass for me. And we developed a way to lay the powdered glass onto the marver, which is you know, where you roll your glass to shape it. And what I've discovered was that if I were to take away information or to use stencils so that there was some powder and you know, there's a positive and negative, I, I call this hot printing. We took a, a Red Devil uh, vacuum cleaner and set it up as if it were a backwards airbrush. So it's actually a vacuum pen but it works like an airbrush with a little hole in it. So I can just vacuum away the drawing. And then when it's picked up on the hot glass, you see the color behind it. So again, developing the contrast. And then, you know, for me, these girls, the cone was a perfect skirt. So then they got to have their heads and the rest of their costume and they got to become more animated and alive. So I guess I do a lot of figures that would be obvious looking in this room. <laughs> and, I'm just, it's that humor thing. I want them to, to kind of be alive, to be your friend, uh, not your friend, but friendly. I don't know. There's a lot of imagery in them. So it's up to the viewer to kind of figure that out. So these earlier pieces from 1985, at the time when I, very, when I started Glass, completely by accident, because somebody saw my drawings and they wanted me to interpret them into, onto Glass to do, and they gave me a commission to do a whole kitchen and of the kitchen cabinets. And so I first found out about acid paste and that was not as satisfying because it's a very light etch. And so the next thing I discovered was available was sandblasting. So, you know, you see that on signage, you see it in restaurants. It's um, a way of putting imagery on glass, but I wanted to take it to the next level. So once I knew there was such a thing as glass blowing, I started trying to find glass blowers I could work with. And actually, all of these pieces were done after I met Dick Marquis. He, I would draw the form, and he would blow the piece, and we would roll the colored glass in another color so that I could start to develop cameo work. And I, I was looking for contrast. I wanted to be able to see the image better than you could just on clear glass. So that's really what I've struggled with and how I've sort of grown my craft into finding ways to present the glass so that the imagery has more contrast and is more visible. This is the most recent piece. And again, I spent three months working on it. But I have to say that the inspiration, one, I was listening to the musical Hades Town and really enjoying it. And then the Roe versus Wade fiasco happened. <laughs> and I just really needed to feel like I could find a voice and a way to express that. So, the story of Persephone, which is, you know, a Greek myth. And so Zeus and Demeter, who is the sister of Zeus, have a child named Persephone. And Demeter loves Persephone. Demeter is the goddess of the harvest, of everything that's fruitful on earth. Hades, who's the god of the underworld, of death, comes to do Zeus and he says, I'm in love with Persephone. I want her for my queen. And Zeus goes, well, yeah, sure, take her. Never ask Demeter. Just gives her away. And Hades, the story is that the earth cracks open. He comes out on his chariot and abducts her and takes her down into the underworld. And Demeter is so upset that after a year of, of searching for Persephone, the earth is just, it's in famine, drought, Everything's dead, and Zeus says, okay, this is like not working out. <laughs> and tries to convince Hades to, to bring her back. But Hades, being a devious fellow, has fed Persephone six pomegranate seeds, so she can only come back for six months of the year. And that is why it's basically the creation myth of the four seasons. So on the other side, you can see that there is the abduction which also becomes the rape, which also becomes the death of the world <laughs> for winter. Luckily, 
they figured it out. <laughs> you know, this is about as loud as I can scream. <laughs> I don't know how else to do that except to, to try and have a voice through my work. I think it's always there. The voice is always there, but a lot of times I'm much more subtle about it. So for me, this was, this really felt like a scream. Uh, yeah, I'm David Svensson, and uh, I'm in Gallery 2 of the uh, Claremont Lewis Museum. And what I'm representing is my neon work. I've been working with neon uh, since around 1984, but I'm combining it with some early experiences of, of working in Alaska with the uh, Chilkat and Chilkoot uh, tribe of the Tlingit people in southeast Alaska. And still I'm highly influenced by their art and their culture and their, their way of life. And, Pretty much the examples that I picked uh, to represent uh, here are all about that, my experience of living in Alaska and seeing the aurora borealis and wondering what that is and that brought me to neon. And, and so I studied uh, uh, here in San Bernardino with a father and son uh, neon shop, uh, Joyce Schmidt Huber and Bill, his son. And uh, they taught me, that's the only way you could really learn about neon is uh, through the sign industry. So I worked with them for about three years. And then, uh, though they knew I was always interested in, uh, instead of following a linear path there of, of blowing bubbles and making, uh, contorting the glass in different ways, uh, thinking of, uh, of the neon in an artful way. And around that time too, and even before me, I was inspired by so many artists from the 60s and 70s who were starting to experiment with neon, including Dale Chihuly. He, did so, he was one of the pioneers working with uh, blown glass and uh, illuminating his pieces. So, so all that influence kind of pulls together here. But uh, primarily it's about, the, the work I have here is about uh, the uh, experience I had in Alaska working with uh, the Tlingit people. Many of the pieces, uh, the uh, sort of the protocol with working with the Tlinka community is you have to have uh, uh, permission, in a sense, to go ahead with, uh, with a project. So uh, often doing the Pilchuck uh, totem pole, the founder's totem, totem honoring uh, Dale Chihuly and the Hobbergs, we had to go to the village of Klukwan and get permission to, to do uh, uh, that endeavor because we were using cast glass and neon backlighting in that traditional totem pole. And they, they originally were thinking neon, and most people uh, think of neon as some bar sign or something, but we had to convince them to know it's more about the Aurora Borealis, which, uh, which is a uh, totemic character in uh, the Tlingit, Northern Tlingit tradition. Uh, this work is called A Long Voyage Home. It's really about my experience of living in Alaska when I was 16 years old in the late 60s worked at this uh, Indian Arts Training Center, the Alaska Indian Arts, which was uh, outside of the village of Klukwan in the town of Haines. I had a bit of skill of carving just from working with my father, so I, they sort of took me in as kind of crazy California kid going up to the, a bush community like this and uh, where these folks have been living there for thousands of years. A lot of hardship for the last hundred years for the basically Native America in general, but the Tlingit community too is hit with smallpox and so forth, the uh, introduction of uh, the outside world. And uh, always with a bit of humor, these folks, somewhat of a, a joke inside of it just to keep the survival going. Basically what I'm doing is using a, an old photograph that was taken in the late 1800s of a Tlingit village uh, that had been abandoned because of the, the hardship there, smallpox epidemic and so forth. So all these poles were just left there. I carved a dugout canoe, which is a traditional the Northwest Coast people used, and have these neon uh, totems, people, clan members coming back in, landing at that village to uh, kind of regain their, their culture and their pride. Similar theme here. This is the soul catcher of light. What I've carved here is a enlarged image of a soul catcher, which was used by a uh, Tlingit shaman to uh, heal one who is ill. And it uh, was traditionally carved out of the femur of a bear or a human bone. Yeah, it was a shamanic tool. And I have this frog coming out of the mouth that's blowing the, the energy uh, out of the uh, the central form here. But again, this is uh, about uh, the photo mural in the back of another abandoned village. If you've lived in southeast Alaska, which is primarily a rainforest, so it's so lush, you're walking through these 
big trees and moss all over the ground and, and mushroom growth coming up. And these are sort of like a mushroom growth rebirth coming up out of the ground to uh, regain the pride of the community and so forth. You know, I have a variety of things. A lot of it is uh, totemic related, and I, I really see this exhibit as a totem in a sense because it's honoring Richard Marcus, it's honoring K.K. Cribs, and uh, somehow I'm in here to honor the past work that I've done. And, and in a way that honors the people that I've been adopted into and my, my father who is an artist in the Claremont community too. And uh, to honor people from my culture, whatever. One of my earlier pieces here is a, a, a carved piece of Abraham Lincoln, and, and I titled it Touched by the Better Angels of Our Nature from his second inaugural address, and I have my neon figures sort of dancing around his, uh, his stovepipe hat and so forth. Very, very childlike thinking there, but I, I like that, uh, and I try to keep that child energy going uh, even though I'm almost 70 now. Those who have an open mind with neon can come in and, and experience uh, what I've made here. But technically, again, uh, R Richard Marcus was such a technician with his work, and I was inspired by that. He, his Italian techniques I sort of transferred into some of my twisting of the, the glass, uh, doing this kind of, kind of a latticino technique with uh, phosphor coatings and so forth to give twists and turns and so forth uh, with the, uh, the decorative element of the, the colors with uh, the tubing and combining that with my uh, skillet woodworking. So it's, uh, it's pretty diverse in the mediums I'm using. I have a little bit of concrete in here too and uh, working with some of my Northwest Coast friends, they're using concrete and glass and stainless steel now as well. So, you know, it's just we're trying to fit into the times and, and, uh, and so forth. I'm using a crackle tube, which is sort of an interesting technique of uh, uh, obstructing the uh, electricity that's running from point A to point B in a neon tube with little glass chips in there so it gives a little movement in the tube. But what's close to me with this is number one kind of honoring a cultural hero and that this piece of wood I carved out of uh, uh, one of the last remaining pieces of my grandfather's citrus grove which was close to Claremont here so so it has that energy of my, my, uh, my family in it as well. Another cultural hero that's more up to date, and he was a, he's a Pomona Valley hero, is uh, Frank Zappa, who grew up uh, partially in this community. He went to Claremont High and uh, has left his mark with many people here, including myself. I, I titled this piece, uh, Absolutely Free, My Other Mother. If you aren't familiar with Frank Zappa, he had a band called the Mothers of Invention and uh, left his mark in the 60s and so forth with uh, incredible uh, music, very experimental, sort of like we've been experimenting with glass and yeah, trying different things, but he's a hero. He's a hero in my life and uh, to honor him is uh, a cool thing that's uh, again part of, part of my culture. The tubes on the top uh, get into a little bit of technical. These are all blown out of the furnace uh, on a blowpipe, which is different than the other works that are represented here. Uh, so it's a very, it's a dance with this movement that you get an end result. At Pilchuck, I was lucky enough to get a gaffing time. A gaffer is one who works with an artist who is highly skilled in their uh, glass blowing techniques and so forth. But I was honored to have Dante Marioni make a couple of these twists here. And Dante's a legendary glass blower who has worked with Richard Marquis and uh, any, ma many of the, the, the recognized glass artists. Uh, but to have him make these twists was really cool. So I processed them, putting neon into the tubes and, uh, and give this kind of spring, this energy, this uh, life to, uh, to Frank here. Frog Hop, that's the title of this work. It represents maybe more of my funk side, even though all of these have this kind of funk quality. I, if you're not familiar with funk, California funk was a ceramic movement in the 60s that uh, Richard was also involved with, and uh, I was inspired by making, making, pulling molds from different objects, found objects, and using them in a unique context. But, uh, but Frog Hop, uh, I wanted to do an animated work using my the single electrode techniques, which uh, is what most of this is, where it's just a, a tube uh, powered by a radio frequency transform that lights up the sculptural form uh, to the the extensions that are on it and so forth. 
but uh, just to have a frog jumping, I'm, I grew up loving frogs. The, the frogs are a key symbol in the Northwest Coast tradition as well. The shaman used it quite often just because it's a, an animal that uh, can go to the underworld and come above. And, During the uh, COVID lockdown, the uh, Claremont community was asked to make a work that represents uh, what was going on during that lockdown. So I uh, made a piece that represents my favorite cereal growing up, uh, life, still eat it every other morning. It also represents, I've got the white tubing uh, figure doing a, a sign which uh, was uh, called the the Ego Warriors sign, and it was produced by uh, Neil Innes, who's one of my heroes too from the Bonzo Dog Band, a British uh, artist, musician, and uh, got to meet him a few times, and he's just such a wonderful guy, and the work that he's done has been inspiring to many, you know, writing for Monty Python, and uh, I've pulled molds from rebar and uh, blown the glass into that, and that's what's dangling down here, sort of like that, that inner mushroom growth kind of going back down into the ground. and and maybe that's part of the, the COVID thing that's, uh, that's uh, disturbed our, our times for the last few years. I come up with these ideas, uh, I sort of call them the dumb idea syndrome, but I work with them and, and, uh, and come up with something to share with others, whether it's dumb or not, it's okay. It's a good way to get that freedom to, uh, to explore and experiment. You know, pulling all of that together has been uh, pretty exciting for the last 40 years. <laughs> and uh, there's quite a consistency with my work. I look back, a lot of these pieces are uh, uh, works that were done in the late 80s, early 90s, and so forth. So in a sense, it's a retrospective, but not complete. But it's more complete as a retrospective of my uh, experience with the Northwest Coast uh, uh, culture and so forth. So I hope you enjoy that. Well, thank you, everyone for watching this uh, exhibition video of Transformations in Glass. And we just want to thank everyone who was involved in making this amazing exhibition come together, especially our exhibition sponsors and lenders who uh, trusted us with all of this amazing work. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, yeah and thank you for being an awesome person to work with. <laughs> yes, Adrian Luce, the director here, she put up with us for uh, uh, the duration of setting up the exhibit and it was fantastic to work with. Great team. All right, we hope you'll be able to see the show in person. See ya. <laughs>